Welcome and good morning from Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us for today's policy briefing, Forging a Path for U.S.-Japan Collaboration on Women, Peace, and Security, featuring Ms. Shanti Shoji, Director of Programs at Sasakawa USA, and Ms. Sahana Dharmapuri, Director of Our Secure Future Program at the One Earth Future Foundation. My name is Nari Tadamura, Associate Program Officer at Sasakawa USA. Sasakawa USA is a nonpartisan 501c3 organization dedicated to deepening the understanding of and strengthening the relationship between the US and Japan for the benefit of a free and open international community. Our activities mainly focus on security and diplomacy through the engagement of exchanges, dialogue, analysis, publications, and networking. Today's event is being recorded and is on the record. A recap and video recording will be made available on Sasakawa USA's website in the coming weeks. There will be time for Q&A later in the program. You can submit your questions using the Q&A function, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions as you think of them throughout the event. I will now turn it over to Dr. Satohiro Akimoto, Chairman and President of Sasakawa USA. Thank you, Narutada. Good morning. I am Satohiro Akimoto, President and Chairman of Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. Thank you very much for being with us this morning or this evening in Tokyo. Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA began to think about woman peace and security soon after I arrived about three years ago. I thought it was important to engage in WPS because I believe in the wide range of ideas and actions which women can offer in supporting people in terms of providing their basic needs and improving their lives in difficult process of conflict resolution and disaster relief. I also know it is not an area that Japan is known to be particularly strong internationally, but I also know Japan has many women who are well-educated, thoughtful, knowledgeable, and strong to make great contribution in this area. I would like to thank my longtime mentor and friend, Ambassador Milan Vervier, Executive Director of Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. She has guided us at the Sasakawa USA as a member of our advisory board with her professional knowledge and special personal warmth, which she had offered in abundance. So thank you, Milan, for your, your friendship and the mentorship to all of us from the bottom of my heart. I would also like to acknowledge our sister organization in Tokyo, Sasakawa Peace Foundation, Ms. Maho Nakayama and Akiko Horiba, engage in WPS activities as a part of their robust peace building program. I appreciate their work and it is our pleasure to collaborate with them closely. I am especially happy to hold this event today as both the United States and Japan have much to offer in this field, sharing the same vision, but having different angles based on their respective political, social, geopolitical and natural elements. But having said that, potential has not been fully embraced yet between the two nations. And Sahana and Shanti, whom we have invited today, will have much important work to take up ahead of them. I am excited to have Ms. Sahana Dhammapuri and Ms. Shanti Shoji to talk about WPS based on their professional expertise and their experience during the recent trip to Tokyo on the subject matter. Ms. Sahana Dhammapri, Director of our Secure Future at One Earth Future Foundation. She has been engaging in a wide range of positions in her professional life, but one thing common is that she has been devoting her professional life in WPS. I'm happy to have her on board on our SEED WPS delegation trip to Japan in July. She has made a great contribution in building meaningful conversation with the Japanese counterparts during the trip. So thank you very much. 
It was her first visit to Japan, and I am interested in hearing what she saw and learned, not only about WPS in Japan, but also about women, people, and society. Shanti Shoji is the director of Sasakawa Peace Foundation in USA. I'm grateful for her for managing most of the programs that we have, but also have taken up WPS as an expert areas of hers. She planned, organized, and executed the WPS research trip in July, consisting of eight experts from the United States. I'd like to thank her for doing a wonderful job on the trip together with uh, Isabel Burke and Kaede Ishidate. Following presentation by Sahana and Shanti, I will invite Ms. Tomoko Matsuzawa of Indo-Pacific Regional Policy Division, Bureau of Defense Policy at Ministry of Defense in Japan. She is Director for Defense Cooperation in the Indo-Pacific Region and Director for International Cooperation on Women, Peace and Security. She will update on developments on WPS at the Ministry of Defense in Japan. So with that, uh, Sahana Shanti, floor is yours. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Dr. Akimoto, for that very kind introduction. I really appreciate it. It's really a pleasure to be here with um, everyone, and we have an audience that encompasses some of our meeting partners in Tokyo. Uh, thank you for staying up so late uh, for us, as well as many of the seed participants who traveled with Sahana and I, WPS practitioners in the U.S., business leaders, media, as well as U.S. and Japan security experts. WPS is relatively new and unknown to many, so I was really delighted to see we have so many joining from various sectors uh, to learn more about this. Um, and since WPS is a new concept, I'd really like to start uh, by taking a step back and give an overview of where WPS originated from and a snapshot of the movement it has created globally before jumping into WPS within the US, Japan, and the Alliance. So the official framework of Women, Peace, and Security was first introduced under United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 in October of 2000. Not only did it formally recognize that women are uniquely and adversely affected by conflict, which then consequently impacts durable peace and reconciliation, but it also recognized the critical role that women play in the prevention and resolution of conflict and in the peace building of safe and secure communities. UNSCR 1325 has four pillars that guide the how, why, and what of the Women, Peace, and Security Resolution. The first is participation, second, protection, third, prevention, fourth, relief and recovery. In a 2004 UN Security Council uh, presidential statement, member states were encouraged to nationally implement UNSCR 1325. So it was suggested that this could be achieved by each nation creating and executing what they call a National Action Plan, or NAP for short, that would implement the four pillars, and by collaborating with civil society, particularly local women's networks and organizations. Since then, 107 UN member states, which is about 55%, have adopted a national action plan. While strides to implement policies and launch new initiatives have been made around the globe since UNSCR 1325 was introduced, progress has been slower than expected. Currently, 30% of the NAPs put in place are outdated and have expired, and based on studies conducted by the Georgetown Institute of Women, Peace, and Security, women remain largely absent in peace negotiations, few gender provisions in peace agreements are present, and no parity in women's representation and diplomacy has been reached. So clearly, there's still a great deal of work to be done to fully realize uh, UNSCR 1325. Um, but that means there's a lot of opportunities ahead as we work through the challenges. So um, regarding the United States, uh, the U.S. adopted its first uh, WPS National Action Plan in 2011, so which was 11 years after UNSCR 1325 was created, and since then has adopted two other uh, National Action Plans, 2016 and 2019. Uh, this year, we'll have the fourth NAP for the United States. And uh, a very landmark moment was in October of 2017 under the Trump administration, 
the Women, Peace, and Security Act of 2017 was passed, making the U.S. the first country in the world to establish a comprehensive WPS law. In summary, this law requires a whole-of-government approach to ensure women have active and meaningful roles in their communities and makes clear the critical, critical role women play in a country and region's peace and long-term stability. On another front, in 2020, a bipartisan WPS caucus was established in Congress, which aims to educate and raise awareness on the public, uh, to the public and members of Congress on WPS policies and priorities, as well as provide congressional oversight on the U.S. WPS national strategy. I would like to take a moment and pause and uh, thank Sahana, who we have here, because it was really uh, her work, she was the one who spearheaded this, was knocking on doors on the hill uh, to get this uh, going to find the members who were committed to this. So thank you so much, Sahana, uh, for your dedication to get this going. And lastly, here in the U.S., and most recently, the U.S. co-chaired with Romania the Women, Peace, and Security Focal Points Network Capital Level Meeting here in D.C. in June. Uh, this annual meeting convenes UN member states and regional organizations with the aim of improving and strengthening implementation of the WPS agenda within each member state. And at this last conference here in DC, nearly 300 participants from over 50 nations were in attendance, uh, Japan included. And also I'd like to um, Ms. Kayla McGill, who was one of our seat delegates who's at uh, State Department was really uh, the force uh, behind the entire planning of that for the US side. So thank you for all your hard work, Kayla. Um, regarding Japan, they formally be began implementing their WPS agenda in 2015 with the creation of their first national action plan. And since then, they have had two updated NAPs, uh, one in 2019 and most recently in April of this year. Uh, furthermore, in October of 2022, the Diet Members Network for Women, Peace, and Security was created, a caucus-like group making Japan and the U.S. the only two countries in the world to have such bodies focused on women, peace, and security. Um, in Japan, WPS has also begun to make its debut at the highest level of government. In March 2023, while in India, Prime Minister Kishida introduced Japan's revised Free and Open Indo-Pacific Plan, which this year, for the first time, includes WPS as a framework to be used. Moreover, he mentioned this uh, WPS in his speech when announcing this revised plan, and it was truly a historic moment to see the WPS agenda being named publicly by the Prime Minister as a tool for peace building. And I'd also like to say our partners at Sasakawa Peace Foundation in Tokyo are working uh, together uh, hand in hand really with um, Honorable Yoko, Yoko Kamikawa in Japan, who is the chair of the WPS uh, caucus there. So um, many thanks to them and all the civil society leaders and actors you can see take a great initiative in uh, moving WPS forward. So while we were in Tokyo learning about Japan's adoption and implementation of WPS, it became clear that there were similar challenges and opportunities that the U.S. and Japan shared. Um, so I'd like to pass it to Sahana, who you've heard has a lot of uh, really on the ground experience and work with WPS to share more about that. Thank you so much, Shanti. Um, and before I start, I also want to just say thank you to Sasakawa USA, who they really put together an exceptional team and an exceptional trip to Japan. Um, I want to also recognize my colleagues that I shared the trip with, my co-delegates. Um, they're really thought leaders in their institutions, in the Department of Defense, in the State Department, in DHS, USAID, and Georgetown. Um, and on behalf of my colleagues on, from the SEED delegation, really want to thank our Japanese counterparts that we were able to meet with at such high levels and people who are really um, taking the initiative inside of Japan to take this issue on and, and uh, really advance women, peace, and security in Japan. Um, I do also think that Sasakawa USA's work on women, peace, and security taking up this uh, policy agenda is really exciting and also very needed. And 
um, I know this is a, a really bad pun, but the SEED program is planting a seed and a really great model for other institutions uh, to, to continue to build and, and grow on. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So thanks Shanti for the, the really great overview that you gave on background of women, peace and security. Um, I think I'll start with some of my experiences or I views on the, the shared challenges and then go to some of the shared opportunities. Um, in Japan, what was really surprising uh, to me is um, there are very a lot of similarities. I think there's two similarities in, in the challenges that we face in the United States and globally. One is the continued need to really strengthen civil society actors, women peace builders, women social uh, justice actors and um, in, in the field, their network, their inclusion in contributing to understanding peace and security threats within their country domestically, but also their uh, perception, their, their ideas and values and needs and priorities um, in looking at international relations and foreign policy defense issues and challenges. And the other piece of that is um, something I think the field struggles with broadly, but we can see it also in Japan as this issue is new to Japan. Uh, and it's something also that the US also struggles with. So this is something I think as a, a shared challenge, it's a, it's a challenge we could probably work on together, um, is communicating women, peace and security more clearly, uh, working on the message and really um, conveying to people what is the main objective, because we do see in Japan, as well as in our country and, and other places, that there's a lot of focus on um, increasing women's representation, particularly in defense institutions, without really um, focusing on including a gender perspective uh, and how to do gender perspective in the daily work of uh, security and defense institutions, foreign policy institutions. But I think even more broadly than that, the key topic, which was fascinating to hear from the women leaders that Sasakawa USA was able to have us uh, meet with, whether they were uh, pro professors, national security experts, uh, public health experts, um, educators, um, people who have worked on climate change issues and disaster relief issues in Japan. All of these women were incredibly uh, successful in their career, thought leaders, um, really made significant contributions. And what they really were getting at is when they were talking about some of the challenges in Japan domestically um, in advancing women's rights was this key issue, what kind of world are we building? What kind of world are we creating together? And if we can do a better job of including women in decision making and their voices on uh, economic and defense and security issues, we could probably come up with better solutions to some of the problems we're facing. Um, and there's three that real three things that really stood out to me as challenges, which I know the Japanese people and government have been trying to work on in terms of women's involvement um, in the Japanese economy with the womenomics program previously, et cetera. But the recognition that there is a declining population in Japan along with an aging population in Japan is you know, really having an impact on the labor pool, right? If the labor pool is shrinking, which has really detrimental effects on the economy um, for Japan. And yet you have uh, women in Japan who really enjoy a very high level of education, really excellent healthcare support. Um, so it is a bit of a conundrum. How come women are not advancing in the way that they really should be given this incredible, you know, position they have in terms of education and the support of healthcare? And in a large part, in, in my view, and um, we could probably ask other people in the delegation, but in my view from what I saw, this is a structural problem of looking at women's status and position in Japan. And here's where I do think that there are shared opportunities um, with the United States. And before I go to the shared opportunities, I do wanna say one more thing about communicating 
women, peace and security and messaging it um, in, in Japan domestically, but also in US-Japan relations because I think those are different audiences. But I think um, going back to, you know, bringing civil society actors together, including women in decision-making for the purpose of really asking ourselves, what kind of world are we creating if we want to create a more peaceful and secure world and a world that is really based on democracy, freedom, human rights, a free and open Indo-Pacific region, then women's full participation, everyone's full participation in a democratic society is key to that. So we want those voices in together in understanding how are we thinking about security? And this is where women, peace and security, that lens is really crucial because it is allowing the space for um, government actors to consult with civil society actors to really understand and redefine what is security and what are the gaps in what we're thinking about security and how do we fill those gaps or narrow those gaps. Um, so to shared opportunities, and that's where I pick up, you know, in this idea of redefining security, looking at the US-Japan alliance, it's really incredibly strong. It's one of the strongest uh, bilateral relationships in the world. My, my understanding is that um, US and Japan make up 30% of the world's economic activities. So our, our ec economy and our defense system are deeply intertwined and uh, reliant on each other, interdependent, right? Um, and that goes to not just the economy and defense, but also our understanding of rule of law, democracy, free trade, how the economy works, et cetera. Those values are also very much in alignment and intertwined. So this is a, a, a really great entry point for women, peace and security, because women's full participation, as I was saying before, in all aspects of society is key to democracy, right? It is key to a, a free and open uh, society. And so that is one of the core objectives of women, peace and security is this um, inclusion of women in decision-making as equal partners um, which will only strengthen the core objectives of, that the U.S. has, right, in, in the region, as well as Japan's objectives in the region. And Japan is really a leader in, in the Pacific region. And I feel that what we, what we are seeing of Japan's parliament taking on a caucus model, um, we had some discussions and interest in what can the caucus do. I think there's lots of opportunities there for uh, shaping some legislation for Japan domestically and for the foreign policy and defense areas. Um, and we know security cooperation activities are already happening between the US and Japan. And I think the addition of this women, peace and security lens is only going to strengthen those relationships, but also part of that strengthening of the relationships and the alliance is forging new pathways and understanding security and being innovative, agile, being able to address emerging threats and challenges and be able to perhaps not be predictive, but be anticipatory, right, of future threats and risks that, um, you know, just some of those things just cannot be solved by a bomb, right, or a sort of deterrence effort, right? These are things like climate change and disaster relief with which Japan has a tremendous amount of um, experience and, and really excels in. So I think there's lots of opportunities for collaboration to be explored. Um, it's very exciting to see the, this parliament in Japan take on a caucus. I think they're still in an exploratory phase, but I think they're really heading into a direction of starting to look at really taking concrete actions. And I do think there's a real opportunity for strengthening, establishing legislation then that, that would make Japan one of two in the world to actually have both a caucus and legislation 
I think that would set a model for the region actually for other countries to further their work. And, and Shanti, as you said, um, you know, only there's 30% of national action plans that might be outdated this year, but there's also 106 countries that have actually adopted national action plans. So Japan could really take a leadership role in the caucus and legislation in adopting uh, more action and implementation and a budget behind their women, peace and security activities. So those are just a few thoughts. And I'm really looking forward to the, the conversation. I'm sure that um, I will say here as a caveat, I'm sure that I did not capture all of the really phenomenal uh, thought leadership and ideas and input of my colleagues on the C delegation. Um, so I, I really do wanna give them a shout out because they're also really instrumental in my um, understanding as well during the trip. So thank you. Yes, and thank you, Zahana. I, I agree. That was one great aspect of the delegation that everyone was, um, you know, the uh, four agencies that are part of the WPS Act here in the United States were included, um, US Indo-PACOM, we had civil society. So um, really our learning and takeaways was so broad in uh, the various angles that are inclusive in WPS. And, um, you know, hearing you talk about how intertwined the US and Japan are, it just makes me think even, you know, more reminds me that um, I feel like the US and Japan are the two countries that really need to come together on WPS. And there's um, really a lot of opportunity. And it just makes sense uh, due to our in intertwined um, relationship that we have with our economies, with security. Um, so I thought I would just share a few um, ideas and takeaways I've had as I've been reflecting over uh, the past month since we've returned on the various uh, meetings we had about where are areas that the U.S. and Japan could collaborate on women, peace, and security. Um, some of these may sound very simple, but I think low-hanging fruit ideas at the beginning are easy. They don't sound scary, and it just gets people connected. It gets uh, the wheels churning and that it could lead to more down the way. Um, but one I have is um, regarding disaster risk reduction, or DRR as um, it's commonly said. But um, unfortunately, due to so many natural disasters that Japan um, has been through, they are really a global leader when it comes to DRR. And we found through our meetings uh, with various meeting partners that they really have you know, taking WPS or taking a gender perspective to heart when it comes to DRR. And especially uh, one thing that I think all the delegates and, you know, we talked about many times, but there was not one meeting that we didn't attend where the 2011 earthquake and tsunami was mentioned as a point for just really change and reflection that something different needed to be done. And, um, you know, I think the U.S. with climate change, we have our own um, natural disaster challenges as we're talking, a hurricane is coming um, in Florida. So, you know, I think that the U.S. has a lot to learn from Japan in regards to their experience and expertise in DRR. Um, and even, for example, we learned that um, Japan has created a checklist of sorts that if you're going to create a relief center, um, you know, these are the things that are needed. And then these are the things that need to be in place for women and girls. These are the things that need to be in place actually for foreigners uh, who may not speak uh, Japanese or um, things like that. And the U.S., uh, from what I was hearing from our delegates, doesn't have something like that. So, you know, I think there's a lot of, we don't have to all start from scratch, uh, but just learn from one another. So I think DRR is a great area uh, for the U.S. and Japan to come together, share best practices. Another is um, external aid. Um, U.S. and Japan for decades have been doing really great work externally on, um, you know, providing aid uh, to countries that are in need of that aid. And um, in Japan, uh, entities like Japan International Cooperation a Agency, or JICA, and here in the U.S., of course, the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, uh, we had uh, Dr. Jennifer Hawkins, um, who is their WPS um, person at USAID with us 
Um, so I'm sure she'd have a lot to add to this, but, you know, coming together for JICA and USAID to talk about, you know, often they're both um, implementing funding into the same country. And if they were working together on um, including WPS um, initiatives in the same way, um, it would just be more of a kind of whole of approach um, that would also signal to the countries receiving that aid, um, you know, WPS is important, US and Japan are working on it. So I think that's another area for collaboration. Um, as you mentioned, Sahana uh, legislation, um, there was interest we heard um, from uh, some that, you know, they are curious about legislation in Japan and interested to learn more. And I think I'm um, creating kind of like a working group uh, with definitely Sahana included for sure um, to just talk about, you know, it took the U.S. five years to get to that 2017 act that was passed. Um, you know, what what was the process? Um, you know, I've heard Sahana say that it's not exactly where we wanted it to be, but, you know, you've got to start somewhere and it, you can build upon it. But again, uh, Japan, if they're interested, doesn't have to start from scratch on this um, and can just learn best practices and maybe some things uh, not to do as well. Um, another one is academia, both in teaching and research. This goes to the communication or messaging point, um, Sahana, that you mentioned as well. Um, the U.S., we have the Georgetown Institute of Women, Peace and Security, uh, which uh, we had uh, Dr. Jessica Smith um, who is from that uh, institute, uh, join us on the trip. Um, so, um, you know, we have a research center and this was um, started by uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton um, in 2011, where they really knew that they needed some, you know, research for policymakers who were saying, what is this WPS thing and why do we need to do it? So uh, they've been doing a lot of research um, and, you know, in Japan, that is not yet existing. There are academics, there are experts who are working on um, these issues, but there's not really a center or dedicated space. Um, there's not, uh, from my understanding, you know, a great deal of classes that um, if you're taking a gendered perspective course, for example, to have a section on WPS. I think there's very um, kind of, again, low hanging fruit areas we can start. But for example, if Georgetown Institute of Women, Peace and Security could share um, their best practices or you know what they've been doing, what they have found is helpful uh, with Japan, with an institute that is interested, I think it's just one place to start, not from scratch and work together. And uh, last but not least, I think it would be great to have a U.S.-Japan working group on WPS uh, bringing together, uh, probably starting small, um, and, but bringing together a few key people from the U.S. and Japan who are really interested on continuing um, this work and, you know, chatting with one another, sharing lessons learned, how things are going in one of those countries. Um, it will just help continually. Um, we need a continual a momentum, like a motor behind a boat uh, to propel things forward. So I think that could be helpful and also help in, um, there's a lot of siloing both in the US and Japan on who is working on WPS and what arena and kind of bringing those people together. Uh, so that is it. Um, and thank you so much, Sahana. It's been really great to share our takeaways uh, with the audience and look forward to the discussion moving forward. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for a wonderful conversation, uh, setting the uh, stage for uh, further uh, discussion today and also down the road. Uh, I have a, a quick question to uh, Sahana uh, about uh, um, this structural problem that uh, you mentioned in Japan. You quickly mentioned uh, women's uh, uh, status and uh, position. Uh, um, how, you know, as I mentioned uh, uh, um, at the opening, Japan has many... Uh, um, women who are well-educated, uh, uh, professional knowledge and uh, uh, expertise uh, and so on and so forth. What, what the, did you observe in Japan with regard to uh, uh, women's status and uh, uh, position? And Shanti, uh, you spent a long time in Japan and worked with Japanese uh, for a long, long time. So uh, uh, I'd like to come back to you after uh, Sahara. Thank you for the question. Um... Yeah, I think this is a really key point. Um, 
what I saw was while women have the opportunity for education and are supported through healthcare, the um, traditional ideas about women's role in society is still very uh, traditional. It is a homemaker, it is to be a mother. Um, and I think women, at least what I learned was, you know, when men enter the workforce, they're considered permanent employees. They will have a career, they will stay in their career. Um, there might be some parental leave, you know, that they are asked to take or they will take, but it's a very short amount of time. They are going to have a full career. Whereas even an educated woman, very educated woman will enter the workforce, but it is already assumed from the beginning that if she's married, it is not going to be a full-time career. So that's one one symptom or one, you know, insight, one point of insight. The other insight as we dug deeper into that and, and we asked some of the, you know, people we were meeting with, some of the women, um, you know, there's also economic trade-offs for men and women, married couples, that even if the wife would like to work and have a full-time career. Um, there's actually a tax credit that couples get, married couples get for women not to work. Um, and it lowers their tax bracket and it improves their economic position. If women decide to have children and then go back to the workforce, both the husband and wife get more taxed, right? It, so the economic debate, like these are simple things, but the economic incentive for people, individual people domestically, just isn't there for uh, women to keep continue to pursue that. But the, you have another trend you're seeing of more women we learned in the national census. There are more and more women who are opting to not get married at all and not have children at all. Um, and so, and, and to pursue their career and be those high uh, wage earners, right? Um, and, in my perspective, my view is that is, this is not a, you know, group effort, an organized effort throughout Japan of women to say, we're not participating in the system anymore. These are individual choices by individual women saying, I don't want to participate in this choice. I don't want to have to give up my career uh, to be a homemaker and then not feel, feel fulfilled in either track, right? So in a way, Japanese women are actually commenting on the structural system and are taking the only option they have. I do think a solution to this problem, which doesn't seem to have been explored yet, um, although there seems to be attempts by the parliament to try to address it through different labor policies, one of the things the Japanese government really hasn't done is is really tried to ask women in Japan, what do you think will help solve this problem? And they could use the national census that is already mandated to take a poll on you know, how Japanese people feel about different topics to ask women, you know, what, what do you think alternatives would be? What would improve this situation? What would make you, you know, have other opportunities or other uh, choices? Um, in society to to fully participate. So those are just, you know, obviously I'm no expert in Japan and domestic economic labor policies or international policies uh, for Japan, but I do think that was a real insight I had in all the meetings that we had with both professional women we were meeting with in their professional cap capacity at the Ministry of Defense or MOFA or the women who were um, representing civil society as academia, doctors, uh, political actors, etc. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Shanti. Thank you. Um, yeah, I really echo what Sahana was saying. Uh, maybe just a few other points um, similar to her, but other examples is really, you know, I agree, kind of breaking um, social norms that have been in place for a long time. Um, you know, one I think is childcare is a challenge. Um, this is also a structural issue, but um, 
if the norm is that women, you know, are to stay in the home really, and um, once they get married and have children, um, the man's role is to work outside of the home. Um, you know, there's no child care really in place for, and it's a problem in the U.S. too. Uh, we haven't figured that out. Um, but I think uh, working on child care could be helpful uh, for that. Um, another is just the pipeline. Um, often, you know, um, the response to there's not enough women um, in leadership roles is, okay, we are going to make a quota. We're going to bring up these women. But um, sometimes it's challenging to fill all the roles uh, because, uh, you know, the pipeline is just not there or there are the women that are there, but behind them are there women coming up that can then take those places and continue to increase the number of women participating. Um, one of our meetings that we had was with uh, the cabinet office of the personnel uh, division, and they're working uh, fervently on this, um, have initiatives to both recruit women and retain women in the government. And, you um, you know, I was impressed with the work they're doing. Uh, they know that they have challenges and there's hurdles, but they are working to put in, to try and change um, slowly some of those uh, social norms and policies uh, that I think keep women um, away. Very much. Uh, obviously, there are a lot to uh, think about and talk about, but uh, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, invite uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Tomoko uh, Matsuzawa of Indo-Pacific Regional Policy Division, Bureau of Defense Policy at the Ministry of Defense in Japan to update uh, developments in Japan. So uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Matsuzawa, could you? Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you, Dr. Akimoto. Uh, good evening from, from Tokyo. Uh, firstly, on behalf of Japan's Ministry of Defense, I would like to express our sincere appreciation to Sasegawa Peace Foundation uh, USA to convene such an important event today and providing me the opportunity to speak about the latest developments that we have made uh, in, in WPS. Uh, while JMOD has been conducting uh, WPS activities uh, quite actively, especially in an international context uh, in the past, uh, given the increased importance of the issue, uh, we have recently decided to further uh, strengthen our endeavor in advanced WPS. And in this regard, uh, JMOD newly uh, established the position of Director for International Cooperation of Women, Peace and Security, which I have been honored to be assigned in, in June. And also, uh, just three weeks ago, uh, JMOD set up the uh, headquarters for WPS promotion in Ministry of Defense. And the first meeting was held under a parliamentary vice minister Onoda. Uh, in this first meeting, um, all generals attended and also from civilian side, we got our administrative vice minister as well as all key DG participated to this the first meeting of this headquarters for WPS promotion in MOD. And we confirmed uh, our firm commitment uh, to promote WPS within MOD and also in the international context um, by taking a whole ministry approach. Uh, currently, we have been co uh, uh, um, developing uh, the concept and also uh, the um, uh, work plan of our upcoming WPS activities. Uh, part of activities that we surely want to pursue is that um, active engagement and contribution to WPS events and trainings and workshops and trade uh, and, and conferences such as this one, mm -hmm. um, especially in an international context. To just to give you uh, the most latest um, uh, activity that we conducted was that I just came back from Malaysia last week where there was a large scale of PKO exercise was conducted, which was hosted by the United States government and the Malaysian government. And as a part of this large scale of PKO exercise, there was um, gender protection training. And I, I was there as an instructor by teaming up with instructors coming from US, Australia, and New Zealand to provide a, a quite comprehensive gender protection training for over 30 participants coming from over 10 uh, nationalities. So this kind of activity is something we want to pursue further. 
And other activity that we want to promote more is that uh, joining and expanding WPS network. Um, earlier, Ms. Uh, Ms. Shoji mentioned about Japan-US network on WPS, which uh, I, I very much agree with it, and um, something we want to deepen um, our commitment to it. Uh, one thing that we have been already doing is capacity building activities. Uh, Japan's Ministry of Defense uh, has over 20 capacity building activities for mainly Southeast Asia, East Asian countries uh, military personnel. And a part of that is uh, PKO and also humanitarian assistance in disaster relief capacity building activities. And uh, this uh, kind of a capacity building activities continued for two, three years. And we have decided from now on, we would ensure to reflect WPS element into all our capacity building activities with regard to, um, uh, to, to the parts that we need particular attention to the vulnerable populations as a targeted audience. And I strongly believe there are lots of potentials that Japan and the US can collaborate uh, by bringing in respective insights and experiences. Um, also, uh, earlier just mentioned by Ms. Shoji that uh, we do have a good experience with regard to humanitarian assistance, disaster relief operations, because we are prone to natural disaster. And in this regard, while as we continue our capacity building projects to, to, to Southeast Asian countries and other Pacific uh, Island countries, but uh, that would be, it would be also desirable if we can collaborate uh, and learn from each other uh, with the United States. And I very much look forward to closely working with the United States and, and all of you attending this event in the future. And I very much uh, hope to meet with you in person, hopefully in near future, to work together. Again, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to get, uh, opportunity tonight. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your concise and yet uh, 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 um, clear and uh, uh, clear presentation that have lots of information. So I really appreciate that. If I may, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, several areas, but uh, what what are the uh, most promising areas uh, uh, for cooperation between Japan and the United States from the viewpoint of uh, 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 hardcore uh, uh, military forces? Thank you for your question. I think this is something we have been already working with the United States, but I think the peace and security area, especially peacekeeping operations, because US and Japan, as a military, we, we haven't really deployed our own personal to the field nowadays, but instead we tend to focus um, our endeavors to provide a support to truth contributing countries coming from the Indo-Pacific region. So US has a lot of experience and also budget and insights and experience. And we do have some, but if we can fit in each other's gaps and also uh, uh, to, to provide our respective activities by avoiding duplication of respective uh, capacity building activities while ensuring to exchange information in regular basis, that would even strengthen our of a, a, like a collaborative approach as a whole. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I would thank like you. to uh, open up the floor. Stay, could you, uh, Ms. Masa, uh, stay, stay there, please? Uh, I uh, would like to open up the floor for uh, uh, questions, and uh, we already have several questions. One is uh, 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 an important question for uh, next generations. We have a uh, uh, you know, young people on the screen, except me, but uh, uh, there are younger generations. And uh, uh, Rubens uh, uh, saint uh, uh is asking uh, 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 what kind of uh, uh, materials or programs that are available for, uh, uh, for his daughter. You know, uh, I'm interested in exposing my daughter to women, peace and security activities. What is the best way to do that? And uh, what resources uh, available. Uh, so I go first to uh, Sahana, uh, and then uh, uh, to uh, uh, Shanti and Matsuzawa-san uh, um, quickly. We're yeah. running out of time. So. Okay. All right. I think this is a terrific question um, and really important one. Um, there are. I'd also like to to say that in women, peace, and security, we do definitely need young people, both men and women, to get involved in the issue set to um, 
start taking opportunities to she depending on her age she could volunteer with um civil society groups domestically internationally she can start to learn about um the issues that are facing other people in in you know in the world climate change is a, is a really important one obviously but more than learning about the challenge learning from other women and young people about solutions that they are coming up with and how are they doing their advocacy and spreading those solutions? Um, there is a formal opportunity actually that I would encourage uh, young people to look into, which is called the Youth Peace and Security Policy Agenda, which is basically modeled after Women, Peace and Security. Um, it, there is an effort in the United States and globally to advance the Youth Peace and Security Agenda. And this is a great opportunity for younger people to uh, get involved, have a voice, help be part of shaping peace and security um, policies or insights, you know, that affect uh, what we're doing. And I think it is something we need to do better at. Um, personally, I think there's too much of a gap between those of us who are doing the work now who are practitioners and the people that we are bringing up into the field. So I, that's something personally I'm, I'm committed to trying to do find a way to do more of that. Well, thank you very much. Uh, one aspect that uh, you pointed out as important uh, in your presentation is communication and the messaging with regard to uh, uh, WPS. And if I understand correctly, you have a very strong feeling about uh, uh, whether or not to have a comma after a, a piece, right? And uh, uh, that has a lot to do with uh, uh, this, you know, definition of uh, women, prison security concept of that. Would you like to uh, talk a little bit about it? Oh my goodness! Um, <clears throat> I will just I say I have a good intelligence about your conversation. <laughs> in Japan. I think I will uh, keep my comments really short because I think my colleagues know about my feelings about this. But um, I will say yes. Uh, women, peace, and security. When it was uh, really envisioned and championed by Ambassador Anwar Chowdhury, who was. Uh, the former ambassador for Bangladesh to the UN and had taken up the uh, presidency at the Security Council, he really championed this idea of, um, you know, let's just put it in basic terms. He saw that women in conflict zones who are living with the consequences of violence on a daily basis across the spectrum of conflict, whether it was beginning conflict, middle of conflict, ending conflict, whether it was state to state violence or um, you know, non-state actor violence against the state, women were holding up the functioning of their societies, were taking care of children, were taking care of their elder elders, were the productive base of the economy, whether or not it was conflict or or otherwise, but they were not included in any of the decision-making processes at domestic, national, international levels. And the thing that he did was to, to draft this statement about the importance of equality between men and women, equality being intrinsic to creating lasting peace and security for everyone. And that that is you know, part of it, it's enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And he also, you know, em emphasized that this is about changing norms and values. This is not something we want to penalize nations for. So it's not passed under Chapter 7, Security Council Resolution 1325. It's not penalized. It is passed under Chapter, chapter 6 of the UN Charter, Pacific Resolution of Conflict. It's meant to be about changing norms and attitudes. So that comma, is very important. What he inserted and what he says when he talks about it is, it's women, comma, peace and security. We are inserting these non-state actors, women who have not really been a part of and have not been allowed to participate in decision-making into, comma, peace and security, international peace and security decision-making. So, that's why, I mean, in, in shorthand, it's important. And I would, you know, go on and on about it, but as my colleagues know, but uh, I think that in, in shorthand, that that's 
that's the reason why that is important. Inserting the, I know the United States has rights it differently in the law and their their work as women, comma, peace, comma, and security, which makes it a list of three things. And I but I think the the intent that Ambassador Chowdhury talks about and, and is enshrined in the Security Council resolution is really this idea of inserting equality, the principle of equality in decision making about what matters in terms of peace and security is really the crux of that. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Matsuzawa, uh, what kind of uh, uh, educational resources, materials, uh, or activities uh, uh, available or you recommend for the uh, um, younger generations around the world or uh, particularly in Japan? Okay, thank you very much. Given the WPS originally started by UN Security Council resolution, I very much suggest to first take a look at UN webpage, especially UN Women webpage and also UNPKO webpage, because when it comes to peace and security issue, uh, in the UNPKO webpage, there are lots, uh, there is a specific area of WPS and gender promotion. And also in the UN um, Department of Peace Operation webpage, they do have a training module for women, peace and security originally designed for peacekeepers, meaning mini, uh, like a military personnel and police personnel, but there are certain uh, module, training module, which is relevant to everybody who wants to know about what is a WPS and how it should be um, dealt in the field when and if you encounter, say, for example, uh, victims of sexual violence in the field. For example, if you encounter child soldiers, including girls. So this is something, if you want to have a, something practical, but still yet to respect the theories and the concept that the UN stick with it, I strongly suggest fans to check UN webpage, especially UN Department of Peace Operation webpage. And also, if you want to learn more about like a gender, like a WPS specific terms, like a, like a gender mainstreaming, gender perspective, and etc., I suggest you to go through a UN Women webpage, from which you can learn a lot. Thank you very much. I'd like to take up one more question, uh, which is from uh, Kathy Bain. Can the National Association for Education of Young Children support ideas for expanded child care in both Japan and the United States, as well as other countries? I think this is question uh, uh, for uh, Sahana, if you can. Um, well, so I'm not an expert on child care policy, but I do think that, um, you know, organizations like like that and others, I think that the suggestion that or one of the ideas that Shanti had brought up uh, in terms of US Japan uh, cooperation at, of creating a women, peace and security working group, maybe US Japan working group, that would be a great opportunity to bring actors together, both from the US and Japan and hear from different organizations like this one about different policies, about different activities, and kind of do a sort of learning tour, right, of, of what um, ideas are out there, what programs are being implemented, um, what solutions are on the table. Again, um, we love to see that kind of collaboration and sharing of information, but also ensuring that women peace builders, women activists who are working on these issues are also participating in a way that allows for those solutions that are happening on the ground that often it's very difficult for policymakers to see and figure out how to adapt something at the local level to a national level policy for, for those actors to be involved in those conversations. Because the the one thing that you know Shanti said and, and actually actually Dr. Akimoto, you said in the beginning, this is new for Japan, but it's new for the United States. It's new for the world. Women, peace, and security as an idea of inserting equality into the ideas about security, what makes a peaceful and a secure world comes from the work of these women in conflict zones. And it is new, it's never been done before. I mean, this is very, very exciting. So yes, we will make some mistakes. Yes, we will have some blind spots, but ideas like Shanti had shared with us and some of these ideas from the from the audience and the Q&A, I think are crucially important to taking on the challenge of being creative 
using this opportunity to share information and take the risk of being a little innovative, doing something that's never been done before and try it, build on it. Um, it will definitely advance the field. Um, it will have committed people. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Shanti, do you have anything to add to this specific question? No? Okay. Uh, I would like to actually uh, take one more question. Uh, uh, this is the last one. And uh, uh, this is from uh, uh, anonymous uh, attendee. And uh, uh, this is actually a question for uh, uh, Ms. Matsuzawa. And uh, um, to uh, summarize, this uh, uh, attendee is interested in uh, a reality of a uh, uh, woman's position in workplace in Japan. Uh, it's not monolithic. There are many different uh, workplaces, but uh, uh, how do you see a woman's place in the workplace in Japan, considering a uh, uh, decline in population and so on and so forth, uh, in terms of uh, equality, uh, advancement uh, uh, in Korea, uh, balancing between uh, uh, you know family, motherhood, and the workplace? And uh, um, this is a big question, but uh, I will be interested in hearing uh, what you have to say. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, yes, Chu, there, there, we, we. And you can speak that... in your personal capacity. Okay, okay, thank you very much, sir. Uh, yes, uh, this is a quite a, a, a really serious challenge that all of us face, not only our ministry, but also as a, as a Japan, as a country as a whole. But to, to, to take a look at from my perspective in my current um, workplace, uh, there are a certain number of women, but like um, the, 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 the person who questioned about this, um, who posed this question uh, mentioned, uh, there, there is still uh, not enough number of women working in a workplace. Uh, I think it's partly because the lack of a chance and also partly a uh, lack of the will. And the will would not come unless there is a, a, a encouragement or, ad, or advantage. So uh, now, um, given the, given the the recent or, or today's uh, situation where we really constantly lack uh, human resource labor force, I think we should do everything uh, possible to expand the opportunity where women feel comfortable and be motivated to come back to workplace. And in that regard, uh, I think some workplace, I think including the Ministry of Defense um, has started or thinking to start to kind of encourage those who actually quit the job, resign uh, from our ministry because of her family issues and et cetera, uh, allow them uh, to come back uh, when they feel it's ready to come back. So I think um, the human resource, once it's recruited, uh, we should try to to keep them as much as possible by offering them the good environment and working condition. And this is something the Ministry of Defense is 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 quite actively uh, trying to do nowadays. I'm not sure if I I, I answer the, the 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 question given, but this is something I I feel it's something that um I also strongly believe that. We should make we should make sure to do everything possible to ensure to bring in those women, especially who wants to come back but who had to leave uh, their their job because of their personal issue or because of the environment by by improving the working conditions. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, obviously, challenges and the problems exist uh, not only in Japan but uh, 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 all over the world. But at the same time. Uh, Sounds like Japan's uh, uh, making at least uh, effort to uh, improve the situation. So I hope that uh, that path will continue. I'd like to uh, give uh, uh, Sahana and Shanti a uh, uh, last uh, opportunity to uh, uh, conclude the event. Sahana. Oh, uh, let's go with Shanti and then Shahana. Thank you. I just wanted to make uh, two very quick points uh, to the question Matsuzawa-san just answered. Thank you so much. Um, in addition, um, during our meetings, we were provided with a lot of information about um, you know, women's uh, participation within the Japanese government or the um, Japanese self-defense forces. And I just wanted to note uh, that from 2015, which again, that's when uh, Japan's National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security was passed, 
it has continuously increased of the female uh, women personnel within the Japanese self-defense forces. Um, so that is really great to see. And also within the Japanese government, um, since uh, 2005 is when I have data from, um, but until now, our rates of women's participation at various levels within the government is also continuing to increase. Uh, so those are great trends that we're seeing. Uh, regarding my uh, closing words, just I really want to thank um, everyone who has come together to make uh, the seed uh, delegation possible for us, all of the eight members who took a week of their life uh, from work and personal life to travel to Japan to learn um, from the various meeting partners we met with from all of those in Japan, including Sasakawa Peace Foundation, who coordinated meetings for us, uh, specifically um, MOD. Uh, we had a very um, long three session engagement um, with them. And so we're very thankful for all the learning they provided. Um, and I wanted to plug uh, two things. One is all delegates, including myself, are publishing our takeaways from our trip. Uh, so in the coming month, uh, you should be seeing on our website, um, those papers being published. And I want to, uh, lastly, Sahana has jokingly but I think it should happen regarding communication, talking about creating a WPS comic book um, to help communicate uh, to the younger generations and just a broader public on what WPS is. So uh, thank you so much. And I look forward to continued engagement in this uh, very important field. Thank, thank you very you. much, Sahana. Yes, thank you, Dr. Akimana. Thank you, Shanti. Um, um, just, I think I would just like to say thank you for the opportunity to um, learn more about Japan and deepen my understanding about U.S.-Japan relationship. Um, it's, it is clearly one of the closest bilateral relationships in the world. And deep, as I said earlier, deeply intertwined, I think women, peace and security will only help to strengthen the, the core objectives of both nations and uh, the objective of security in the region. And I'm very looking forward to continuing uh, working on this issue and learning more. Um, and as I said, you know, Japan is new to us, but so is the United States. And we have a lot to do together, a lot to work together on. And I really look forward to that. Thank you. Ms. Matsuzawa, would you like uh, an opportunity to say a word or? Uh, yes, um, thank you very much once again for giving me this opportunity to attend such a uh, very um, uh, important event and also giving me the chance to introduce the latest activity that we conduct. As a Ministry of Defense, as I mentioned, we have a firm commitment to advance WPS and we very much look forward to closely working with you all. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. You uh, uh obviously uh, uh, represented Japanese women very well with your uh, expertise you. as well as your ability to uh, connect with the uh, outer world. So thank you very much. Thank well, you. thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, we uh, uh, ran out of time, but uh, uh, I was really uh, uh, delighted to have uh, uh, this event and uh, uh, continue to, I uh, would like to continue to work on this subject matter. So uh, thank you very much for all the participants. Uh, and also uh, uh, speakers uh, uh, looking forward to uh, uh, doing this again in the future. So thank you very much. Bye-bye.